well, now to finish how proper names really work, examination of counterexamples. The counterexamples to descriptivism imagined can find a more complete descriptivist answer with this uh, meta-descriptivist theory. At first I consider Kripke's famous Gödel's counterexample. Since the name Gödel is linked with the description, the inventor of the incompleteness theory, and Kripke supposes it has been discovered that he has stolen this theorem from Schmidt, Kripke claims that according to descriptivism, Gödel should be Schmidt. But we all know that even in this case Gödel remains Gödel and should not be called Schmidt. Considering our rule of identification for Gödel, we see that Schmidt is far from satisfying its proper identifying rule. For the person who satisfies the localizing description for Gödel continues to be the man who was born in 19. 1905 in Brünn, who studied in Wien and died in 1976 in Princeton. Moreover, Gödel continues to satisfy partially, maybe by two-thirds, the characterizing rule for Gödel since the discovery of the incompleteness theorem was surely not the only relevant thing he did as a logician. Well, he also married Adele, but this has nothing to do with our tema. Another example is from Donilon concerning, concerning Thales. The only description linked with Thales is the philosopher who said that all is water. Suppose that, in fact, Thales were only a wiser well digger who was tired of this profession and said, how good it would be if all were watered, so that I would not need to dig these damned wells. And that because of misunderstanding, Aristotle and others come to believe in the description that there was really a philosopher called Thales who sustained that uh, the principle is water. Suppose that, also suppose, said Donelan, that a hermit in a forgotten time <coughs> really said that all is water. We will not say, <coughs> says Donelan, that with Thales we are referring to the hermit. Our answer is that many names have a causal history, and that this causal history can be so important that it will be included in the characterizing description. This is precisely the case of Thales. Outside its proper context, the description, the philosopher who said that all is water, has no intrinsical worth. It is, as Donelan said, a ridiculous statement. The importance of the description is achieved by its role in the history of philosophy, so the characterizing description must include the important moments of this history. So the characterizing description must include elements essential to the causal history, for example, as the first Greek philosopher who originated the, the dosography of Aristotle and others, where he is referred as having said that the water is the principle, and so on. If you see this, it turns to be clear that Thales must be the well digger, since he satisfies in some measure the localizing description for Thales. He is the person who lived in Mileto from 591 before Christ to 585 before Christ, and uh, it is the person who satisfied the 
Characterizing the description, the first Greek philosopher who is referred in the Doxography by Aristotle and others as having said that the water is the principle and so on. Since the, he, the well digger, is the person referred in the Doxography and so on, we can conclude that by the so formulated description theory, the well digger must be Thales. On the other hand, Donald's Hermit satisfies only very partially the characterizing description and nothing from the localizing description, so it does not satisfy the third condition of the rule. It is a bad competitor uh, comparatively to the well digger. This is why the well digger is Thales and not the Hermit even from a descriptivist perspective. A final example is that of semi-fictional names like Robin Hood or Jonas. Kip uses Jonas, but uh, we believe that Jonas were really a fictional character and not a semi-fictional one. Well, Robin Hood. We know that probably existed someone who originated the many stories of Robin Hood. But we do not know anything for sure about Robin Hood. Some suppose that he didn't live it in the forest of Sherwood. Some suggest he was not an outlaw. Even the name could be a different one. Therefore, only the causal historical theory explains our belief that there is an owner for the name Robin Hood. So they say. The descriptive answer is that a semi fictional proper name abbreviates two kinds of descriptions, the fictional and the non fictional ones. In some cases, we know what are the fictional descriptions. In other cases, like that of Robin Hood, we are not able to distinguish the non fictional descriptions. Nevertheless, historical research could find them. If this occurs, we'll be able to distinguish the non-fictional descriptions. Suppose we discover the first possibility. We discover that Robin Hood really existed in the 13th century and that he was an injustice man from the nobility who lived in the forest and helped the poorest and so on. This already satisfy, satisfies the localizing and characterizing descriptions known by us and North to justify the application of the name. But suppose instead that we discover that the first writer who imagined the story was inspired by the brave behavior of his dog called Robin, who used to go with him as he hunt in the forest of Sherwood. In this case we would not say that the dog baptized with the name Robin is the true Robin Hood. We would say that he is indeed a purely fictional character. Nevertheless, it seems that according to the causal theory, the dog must be the real Robin Hood, for to us even baptized with the name Robin. I cannot in this summary consider all the examples. However, it seems clear to me that the present version of descriptivism is more able to explain the facts not only because it gives a strengthened answer to the counterexamples to descriptivism, but because it incorporates in itself the advances of the causal historical view. Well, you can learn something more, maybe in my paper, but uh, most things are still in Portuguese.